today's, uh, you know, I, I can see the crowd is sizable and it's wonderful. So this is something, this, this is a topic apparently that interests most, most of you. I think most of us, like Ramya was saying, it, it impacts the very fundamentals and questions the very fundamentals of what you actually do. It's not about what you do, but who you are. And these are questions probably that answers some part of it. So today's, uh, we'll wait for another minute before we start. And those of you uh, who are uh, logged in remotely, welcome. This session is being live streamed across the world. So we have alumni who are logged in remotely. And uh, this would also be archived. We are taking a video and all these sessions would be available on YouTube and on our website. Our website is imbaa.org. This, is, this session is called Saturday Musings. We have this session once a month on the third or fourth Saturday, right? And uh, this is the fourth session. We started it in Jan. And uh, the whole idea is to get faculty, industry experts, alumni to share their experiences and how we can learn from one another. And that's a whole uh, higher, order, higher order bet. See, today's topic is very interesting and it excites most of us, you know, nurturing excellence at work, a strengths-based approach. Before we start on formally kick off the session, I'd like to know how many of you have children going to school? Ah, that's a sizable number, <laughs> so that's me too. Okay, okay, let me share a few observations uh, so that we put the whole session into context. Uh, whenever this PTA meet happens, now what happens, what I have noticed is you have the teacher, you go sit down with the teacher and she pulls out the question, the answer sheets of the child and the conversation starts like, uh, I think you could have done better, right? Uh, your child is capable, your child is capable of doing much better and how much is this child scored? 95, right? <laughs> so and, and you're wondering and the child is sitting out there you know, the shoulders are already drooping and the parent is sitting in front and, and turns at the, you know, faces the child and says, uh, hey, this problem, we did this yesterday, right? You forgot the, how to do this and she's putting on a smile. Actually, instead, she's not too happy about it, okay? And the teacher also nods her head and child drooping shoulders like this and uh, the child is perhaps wondering what's happening out here, right? That's scene number one. Many of us probably have have gone through this as parents and we'll probably at the PTA meets. Scene number two. See, uh, I've been an entrepreneur for a couple of decades and I meet a lot of people. So there are, there are people whom I meet who say, look, I'm, I'm now working in a company. It's been 15 years. So they have saved enough of money. They have built networks. They have uh, built on capabilities, and yet there is something that stops them from going ahead. The dream is to actually do something on their own, but there is something that stops them. So I usually ask them, what stops you from pursuing your dreams? Your heart is to do something on your own. So there's usually I, the kind of responses I get is, um, look, uh, can you give me a good idea to start with? Okay, I think I don't have the money, so sufficient money, uh, what happens, what would happen if I fail, you know? Would the industry take me back? I need to have co-founders. I don't have co-founders. I need to have a large office to start with. So there are a lot of questions. That's scene number two, right? Scene number three. If you ask someone, if you ask people, what do you think about politicians and bureaucrats in general? The kind of responses I get is politicians are corrupt, Bureaucrats are corrupt, they're not trustworthy, they're not reliable, right? Scene number three. What is common across these three scenarios, you would have probably guessed, is our focus is on what is not okay with the system or okay with the situation. The, the, the focus of the parent or the teacher is on the five marks that the child has not got not on the 95 marks that he's done right. And the child is left wondering, hey, I got 95 marks, why is, why is no one asking me about how I got those 95 marks? 
what are the strengths did I exhibit in getting those 95 marks, right? And the entrepreneur is looking at that one reason for not doing something and not following his dreams, right? Instead of focusing on the 98 things that will motivate him to do what he really truly wants for himself, he's focused on those two things that will stop him from doing something. He's almost like searching for those reasons that will stop him from doing something. His mind is actually blocking him. It's not the capabilities, it's not the skills, it's not the money, right? And about politics and about bureaucrats, we, we constantly look at the TV debates. We are constantly looking at what is wrong with the system. We don't ask what is right. There are, there are people who actually do a lot of stuff. Politicians do a lot of things right. They're doing their best. Bureaucrats do their best to the best of their abilities. And yet, no one asks those questions. We ask about what is, and we point out mistakes in the system, right? So these are just some of the observations. You can, you can reflect on, on what's happening out here. But somewhere, there is a tendency to focus on what is wrong and what doesn't work, rather than what will work for us. Somewhere I have read that there is a tendency for us, given a choice between moving towards something that you truly want for yourself, right, and avoiding something that you don't like, that somewhere at some level is going to impact your uh, chances of survival, we would always, always avoid doing something we truly want and run away from fear, okay? And that is possibly something to do with when our neurology, how our brain is structured, and our physiology. I just leave these thoughts to you, these three scenarios, to put the whole session in context. Another thing I just wanted to share, when I looked at the topic for today, there are two words that drew my attention. One is strengths, another one is excellence. When you talk about strengths, implicitly, you know, it means that there is something called a weakness, right? And then you would like to question what exactly are strengths? What exactly are weaknesses? Some of the weaknesses could actually be strengths if you change the context. In a different context, something can be a strength. So another thought that comes to my mind is, let's say, suppose you want to manage your anger. You think you're a short-tempered guy, it's not helping you in some context, and you want to work on that. So you work on your anger, and, and you go for meditation and stuff like that, and you, you do use various strategies, and there you are able to manage your anger. But managing your anger, not being angry, is not the same as being calm. When I seek to be calm, right, is not the same, because my focus is on anger. It's still on anger. Not angry is not the same as being calm, right? That's another thought I'd, I'd leave with you. So when we talk about strengths, these are some of the questions that pop up. Another question that pops up is, having a strength and not having a strength, is it as important as having the belief that that strength will help you in achieving what you want for yourself, right? If, if I have an outcome that I want for myself, but I, I first need to believe that the outcome is desirable. Number two is I need to have belief in the abilities and the skills that that particular strength will help me execute. I'll be able to execute the behavior that will help me get the outcome that I want for myself. So it's the belief about the strength which might be more important than just having the strength in itself. Having a dominant strength is of no use. You need to believe that with that strength, it will help you achieve your, the, the outcome that you want for yourself. So I will leave these thoughts with you. And uh, this session, anyway, we have experts to be uh, sharing their learnings with all of you. The today's session is split into two parts. The first part is, is a 30 minutes talk by Professor Ramya Ranganathan. And the second portion is a panel discussion we have some eminent alumni with us who will, uh, you know, we will discuss on this topic and explore various perspectives. So let me quickly introduce Ramya, and then Ramya shall take over. 
Professor Ramya Ranganathan is an electrical engineer from IIT Madras and holds a PGDM from IIM Ahmedabad. And she also has a master's of research as well as a doctorate in management from the London Business School. Ramya worked in corporates such as ICICI, Infosys, and Citibank. Ramya teaches, she teaches postgraduate, doctoral, and executive courses on OB, crafting careers, aligning personal values and goals, managing inner worlds, positive psychology, nurturing creativity and excellence, intrinsic motivation, emotional intelligence, stress management, and personal energy. She has taught several customized workshops for the public sector, as well as the private sector. Clients such as NHPC, Atlas, Coopco, India, Gale, No Nordus, ISRO, HLL, etc. She has previously held the positions of Program Director, Management Program for Women Entrepreneurs, and Program Director, Management Program for Entrepreneurs and Family Business at IIM Bangalore. These are two programs which are very popular. Some of Ramya's landmark courses and workshops are personal values, goals, career options, positive psychology, positive organizational scholarship, leading with joy, being a learner. The, the list is long, managing emotions. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> OK, OK. So her sessions have, are very popular among students, houseful. OK. Her current research is in the areas of personal values and attitudes, personality theories, flow, joy and creativity in work, multiple identities, illusion of control, locus of causality, personal mission and career choices, conflict and emotions in small groups and teams, individual and group decision making, CSR and social entrepreneurship. Welcome, Ramya. Thank you, Partha for the very kind introduction and for the lovely questions with which you set the stage. So welcome uh, everyone, welcome those who are online watching through webcast. And uh, just occurred to me this morning when I was um, walking here that today is actually the global day of communion with the earth. So yeah, doesn't really tie in with this, but maybe it would just contribute to you. Okay, so uh, before we started, I realized that uh, um, I forgot to mention to Partha that there's actually a prerequisite for this session. And uh, let's just hope that everyone's made it. So the prerequisite for attending this session is that at some point in your life, you should have been five years old. <laughs> is there anyone here who sort of just like you, you just, you, you landed up here grown up or everyone's been there? Everyone's been five? I want to show off hands to be absolutely sure, because otherwise you have to leave. You're not allowed to sit through this session. OK, great. So this is a prerequisite, because this is actually the first exercise that we're going to start Okay, today's uh, session with. So I want you to just take a minute now, close your eyes, and reconnect with how you were when you were a five-year-old girl or boy, and just become that person again. And eyes closed. If your eyes are open, you're still your current age. If your eyes are closed, I know you are five years old. And I want you to think of something that was very natural to you, something you really enjoyed doing at that age. Something where, you know, you just flowed and you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, you know, you probably didn't even use the word great or good, but you just felt so alive when you were doing it. And it was just your thing. It could be dancing, playing. Maybe you were the local goon who liked to gang up the other kids and boss around, climbing trees. Maybe you like words, collecting information, painting, creating new stuff, running around. Whatever came naturally to you and brought you fully into yourself. That was one of your strengths then. So I want you to open your eyes now and just turn to the person sitting next to you, whoever's closest. So if you're sitting alone, whoever's closest to you, and take like, you know, one or two minutes each and just share with this person 
the strengths that you became aware of, and this is just one of your strengths, but when you were five, something that was definitely a strength for you. Just share this with that other person. And those of you who are alone at home watching on webcast, you can just journal. Pick out a pen and paper and just write about it. Two minutes with the person next to you and take turns. <coughs> Okay, so are you done? Yeah, had a chance to share? Okay, now I want you to remain five years old for another couple of minutes and there's no hurry to grow up and you can grow up after this first story. So remain five for now, okay? Uh, so uh, some of you might have heard this story before but I'm just gonna tell it to you once again. And uh, so this is the story about the animals in the jungle who got together and decided to form a school because they wanted to grow and they wanted to learn, they wanted to become bigger, better, not bigger, but better, and they wanted to pursue excellence. So they said, let's have a school, what better way? So they had a school. What's the first thing you need when you have a school? One of the main things. You need classrooms, you need teachers, but you also need a curriculum. You can also decide to teach one another, but you need a curriculum. You have to decide what are we going to learn here. So they came up with a core curriculum of six subjects. Can you guess what it was? Okay. Running, jumping, flying, climbing, swimming, crawling. Okay, comprehensive curriculum. And they started having lessons. So they got the teachers, they got the experts, and they have started having lessons. So in, at the, in the beginning, the dog was having an awesome time in the running class. He was alive, in his zone, doing well, excited. And then what happened to the dog in the climbing class was he fell down and he broke a leg. And it took a little while to heal and he was limping. And then even the running class was sort of a pain for him when he was injured. The duck was completely doing her thing in the swimming class. It was awesome. And in the running class, she wore out the web of her feet. And then even the swimming classes were like, oh, I have to go to swimming class. And the rabbit was doing really well and having a lot of fun in the jumping class. And in the swinging class, <laughs> he sprained his back. And then jumping was also like, oh, I need to jump, OK? And so it goes on. And uh, at the end of the year, the class valedictory, so you know, it's like the gold medalist that you give, was an eel. 
So if you don't know, even I had to Google and look up what is this animal. So it's this little snake-like animal that can do a little bit of everything, but nothing very well, but it could do everything. And you know, so, so the prize went to the eel. So we can grow up now. <laughs> and this is sort of just to set the stage for the strength-based approach. And when I tell this story in classes, I mean, I mean, the first thing is that most of us resonate with it at some level. And then at the same time, you're also very distinctly aware, even while listening, yeah, but those are animals. We are different. We are all, you know, the same species. But that's a question to really ponder on. We are all the same species, but are we the same, right? Are we not multifaceted people, just like the animals with skills and strengths and abilities? And uh, is there um, anyone here who is, doesn't have a weakness? And like, you know, like Partha said, you define strength, you define weaknesses. They're just English words. What, and you know, you can't define weaknesses in vacuum. They have to be defined either in comparison to something you yourself are good at. So this makes me feel awesome, great, comes easily to me. This one feels like I have to drag myself to it. Therefore, for me, this in contrast is a weakness. Or it comes in comparison with other people. Class of 50 students, everyone else can do this. You can't. This is your weakness, OK? So even to, even to like conceptually conceptualize something like a weakness, there has to be some kind of comparison. You're either comparing against something that you yourself are good at, so and therefore it's the polarity, right? So if you define strengths naturally, there is, yeah, there is something called weakness once you're labeling something called strength, but the two ways, right? One is with regard to yourself, yeah? And the other is with regard to other people. And both these definitions are used, and they're both valid, and they're both logical. So just hold on to that, and we'll, See where that takes us. So <laughs> now this is just to look all academic because I am a professor, and uh, but it is academic actually. So the, I'm going to pose a question to you. So what do you think is the connection between strengths defined as something you're good at, comes easily to you, naturally to you, you love doing it? It's like you. It's an expression of you that's quite effortless relatively to other things. So what's the uh, link between strengths, performance, which is how well you do in any task, and happiness, which is just how you're feeling, OK? What do you think is the relationship? Directly proportional. Directly proportional, yes. They're all very highly, highly, highly correlated, OK? It is not a trade-off. It's not, shall I be happy, or shall I work on my strengths? Shall I play to my strengths? It's not, shall I do well? or shall I play to my strengths? It's not, shall I do well, or shall I be happy? All these things go together. And you actually don't know this, need this research. Your own experience will tell you that. Think of something you're good at, something you love doing. You're motivated to learn more. You seek mastery. You're doing well. Yeah, it's, it's all going together. But uh, there are also yeah, the world of research, the corporate world of research, and when I mean the corporate world of research, I mean um, research that is typically used in organizations, yeah, so the HBR kind, the first kind, the application research, based research, both that as well as the theoretical side, so these are the more, you know, academic journals, they have a ton of studies, right? There's been a ton of studies in the last 20, 30 years, and it's really picking up now thanks to neuroscience, like you mentioned, because we had learned, we, we are figuring out new ways of actually measuring and studying happiness and performance and all of that. But, but there's just loads of research, and, and there is no dispute, yeah? So the research is fine. It's, it's clear. These things go together. Now, if intuition is like, yeah, that's what my experience confirms, and research is saying, yeah, but then, like you said, in schools or in organizations, in the world of workplace, within the structure and the, so in the world of behavior, we don't see it happening. Does that make you curious? It makes you curious, right? It makes me curious. So one of the things that I want us to explore today, right? So I, I don't want to spend time, you know, telling you that, hey, look, look, this is finding number one, finding number two, finding number three, two, prove you know, this thing that all these things go together. You can look that up on your own. So this, 
I, I'd like this, and that's why we have a panel discussion as well after this. I'd like this to be an exploration really about, okay, so if there are all these like, you know, benefits and good things to playing with our strengths, but we are not really doing it, then clearly there must be something else, right? There must be more. Let's talk about that, okay? Let's see what, what could that be, what's probably, I don't know, why is it not happening, okay? So that's uh, something that I'm hoping we're gonna get to. Okay, so, so this is, so I'm, uh, so what I've uh, planned these slides as, or you know, these 30 minutes that I'm talking, I'm gonna pose a series of questions really, right? Questions so that it also sets the stage for the panel discussion and exploration that we'll have after this. So, so the first question is about this notion and construct of ideal. Again, probably when you actually, we were five years old, you didn't have this construct of ideal, ideal child or something. You just were. You were who you were and you were having fun. You were doing what you wanted to do and that's it. Yeah? Um, this notion of ideal is a socially constructed notion. So we, in schools you can start saying, okay, the ideal student, the ideal gold medalist, and then we have the ideal MBA student here, or you'll have an ideal manager, or even within that you'll say, okay, so you know, you can actually look up, you can, I was doing Google images for slides for these, and I put the word ideal, and I put ideal manager actually, and I came up with all these uh, templates and advertisements actually called ideal marketing professional, ideal networking. So, so even within the subfields, there are these ideals, like if ideal consultant, ideal banker, you know, these are the qualities, these are the abilities, these are the things. So we create these ideals. Why are we creating these ideals and what is the effect that these ideals are having for us, okay? And so I want us to probe into this a little further. So clearly there is some functionality for creating a prototype of an ideal student or ideal manager or ideal banker, ideal consultant. Consultant. It's helping in some way, but it's also creating a related set of problems. So just hold on to this notion of ideal. Let, let this question churn and let's <coughs> look up. Um, or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we'll, I'll, I'll just sort of uh, close this a little bit before we move on so we don't have too many questions. So, uh, so just as a sort of uh, hinting at what we're gonna talk a little further, so this notion, construct of ideal is closely tied to the construct of roles, right? So if I say ideal consultant, the reason you've defined something like that is because within organizations, or let's say within a consulting organization, you have a certain role. And now you've defined the certain role in a certain way, so having that ideal inform means if you are ideal consultant and this is a role of a consultant, hey, there's an easy way for us to do that fitting and therefore get work done, okay? Has its pros, has its cons. Start thinking about both. Now, <clears throat> now let's look at excellence, okay? And how is this construct of ideal, now how does it tie into excellence? So what does excellence mean? Again, you started us out on that journey very early, and seriously, what is it? It has different definitions. Some say excellence is not a destination, it's a journey. Some say it's not being the best, it's being your best, all of which are true. In a sense, it's just, a, again, an English word which most of us are using, both in academia as well as in real life, as well as in our corridor conversation, to denote something, right? And that something is about getting better and better in some way. Usually it's about growth, it's about doing more, it's about achieving more, it's, it's about becoming better versions of ourselves. Now those better versions of ourselves, it can be better versions of ourselves, or it can be becoming better and better in a way that we start conforming more to that ideal. Do you get that? So, so if I'm trying to be an excellent consultant, I know this is an excellent consultant needs to be great at making, um, at client interaction, at making presentations, at uh, number crunching, and what else? <laughs> something, right? So, so these are the things, and so if I want to get excellent there, I have to start somehow fitting myself into that and getting better in those things. Or there's another way of looking at excellence, which is I just, well, I am who I am, and I just become better and better and better versions in those same things. Now, I want you to notice that in both these, there is growth, there's development, right? 
And that's sort of the imagery that's portrayed here in the two approaches. So one is, think of it as sculpture or an artist, right, where there's a certain vision and ideal of what, <clears throat> and here's where I want to also talk about the role of mentoring, right? So you can think of it as parenting since you, you know, brought that the parent out in us very early in the session. You can think of a parent, a teacher, a boss, a manager. Yeah, anyone who wants to nurture excellence in another person, right? So one is nurturing excellence in ourselves, one is doing it for others. So if you want to be that mentor to another person, you can have in your own head, this is what is ideal. And I'm going to help you get here. I'm going to help you fix those holes, fix your problems, enhance what you already have, and we'll get you moving more and more towards this vision, this ideal that I have of excellent student, excellent manager, excellent um, <laughs> consultant, excellent banker, whatever, okay? So that's the first one. The second approach which of mentoring would be that of a gardener, right? Where you put a seed into the ground, and let's say you plant here you see an orange tree, right? You put an orange seed and you water it. You're still tending to it because if you didn't give it all that nurturing, it might not grow out to be as nice as it could. So you keep away, you fence it, you put the manure, you put the water, you make sure it gets sunlight, you talk to it, and you nurture it to become the most excellent orange tree that it can. Are there different kinds of orange trees? Yes, yeah. But if you put an orange seed and you say, I want you to give me jamuns. <laughs> I want you to give me jamuns. It's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. That's because there's an implicit understanding here that that seed has carries with it a certain kind of a blueprint, a certain kind of a program, a certain kind of this kind of blueprint. And you can take that blueprint to its most excellent form. The idea with clay is that I can give it any form I want. Okay, it has some inherent properties, yes, but it's not, I can shape it into a mango or whatever, right? So that is the sculpture. Now again, coming to us as human beings, are we more like the seed or the trees or are we more like clay? Can we be shaped into anything? We don't know. We really don't know. And this is, this is actually a heart of what we try to find a lot about. So if you, for example, if you look at OB and psychology, there's tons and tons of, you know, uh, research on personality, on genetics, on all of that. Everywhere we're trying to get to this question, right? Are people born with certain blueprints? Are there fixed abilities? Can we change into anything? These questions are still awake, alive. We don't have clear answers. Now, we don't have clear answers in terms of if you just look at the physics of who we are and what we've understood. But, but rather than just exploring this at a level of physics of how we are created and composed, I want you to also look at the level of, just at the level of philosophy, right, about what you want. Do you want to create ideals? Do you want to have that ideal consultant, ideal student? Because that didn't exist in nature, right? So if it, it, there isn't something on the sky saying this is an ideal human being. This is an ideal woman. This is an ideal student. This is an ideal Indian. This is an ideal banker. This is an ideal politician. These things are not pre-existing. We create them together as society. Now, the choices, and, and when we are creating something, we always have a choice. Do we want to continue creating it, continue buying into it? How significant and how important do we want to make it? Is it helping us? Is it serving us? Or is it not? If it's serving in some ways, not serving in some ways, then start looking at it. You know, to what extent do we want to hold on to these? So looking at that notion of ideal, again, in this in these two things of, you know, is it, is, are we like, uh, do we come in with blueprints or are we completely man malleable and uh, can be changed and grown into anything we, anything we or anyone else desires? There is no answer. Now, ideologies are there. Religions have answers about this. There are religions which say this is an ideal person, this is an ideal human being. And again, because we have different religions and different ideologies, we have different varying versions, okay? So we won't really go into this. I just want you to realize that it is man-made. 
in, uh, if, if you're a Hindu, actually, you've got it going very lucky because Hinduism has both, if you're curious, within one. <laughs> so it's, we are very clever because we have multiple lifetimes through which, which we give ourselves for growth and evolution. The, uh, the Hindu philosophy on this is that within a certain lifetime, you sort of have a certain blueprint, a certain seed. It's called your Swadharma. And you can reach excellence within that, using that blueprint. But over multiple lifetimes, you can reach that ideal of ideal whatever that you want to reach. Some other religions would want you to do it in one lifetime. So I, it doesn't matter. Just want you to recognize at this stage that this is all socially constructed, OK? Now, OK. So, uh, so and, and if it is socially constructed, then it is something that at least I think it's valuable to inquire into. If it's helping us, is it not helping us, OK? Now, <clears throat> now, some of you might say all this is fine. Yeah, so this ideology of, yes, you know, you have ideals and you have roles and you, you want to start measuring and, you know, it gets stifling. But if you don't have that, then how do you compare people, right? So again, question. The inherent need to compare, it's not there in nature. We created it. But let's see why we created it, right? We created it in schools and we created it in organizations because we somehow want to reward, somehow we want to compensate, somehow we want to encourage, and you know, we want to motivate people. And so we are using that kind of a comparison. So, so there's a reason for it, right? So if this, that's the reason, now the question that I want to pose is, is that the only way to motivate? Is that the only way to encourage someone to grow? Is that the only way to push and trigger someone to become more and more excellent comparing with others? Because comparing with others has an inherent flaw, as you can see. It's always going to be comparing apples and oranges. All of us here, no, no I can't, like, no two of us between, pick any two people from the audience, it's going to be an unfair comparison. It is. And when you want to do that, then you, know, you have to start coming up with criteria like they've come up, amount per calories, carbohydrates, sugar, or whatever. And then the minute you start putting those criteria, that's your roles, right? Like the ideal consultant. That is where those ideals are coming in. You say, I want an ideal consultant because I have this role of an ideal consultant. So I create these criteria, and then I'll compare. Now I can compare Sai and Partha on who is a more ideal consultant, yeah? So, so, so here's where I'm tying in this need to compare is also connected to the construction of the ideal and the definition that we give it. If you're not buying into it, all of this starts dropping, 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 and actually it loses its meaning because without those rows and columns, apple, orange, who's, who's going to compare? No one, right? No one can do it. And again, yeah, so this is probably something I can see the audience resonating a lot with. I know all people crushed and crammed inside that. We've all been there. We've all gone through it. We know how it feels. And can it motivate? Does it motivate to some extent? Yes, but at what cost? This is probably something we'll take up more in the panel discussion as well, because I have also been here trying to really get to this 10% based on the external criteria that has been set for that 10%, but giving up a lot of other things along the way. So the question there is, is that the way to excellence? Now, from the perspective of organizations and managers, I hear back all the time from when I teach executives and people who are actually team leads, I have a team of five people, I have a team of 12 people, and I hate to have to fit them into the bell curve. And my thing is, you know what? That's because, if you remember statistics, the bell curve was a distribution of large numbers, large population distribution. It, you can't put it on five people and 10 people. That's not, I mean, I would have statisticians turning in their grave if they were like, this was a normal population. That's the other curve for bell curve, normal. So here you are doing, you're saying, I'll admit all the 99th percentile people, or I'll put them all through this test. It's not a normal population anymore, and then I fit them into my normal curve. It's bizarre. 
but we are doing it. I know, and I hope I don't sound like I'm mocking because I'm also doing it as part of this very institution. We do it here also. We are questioning it, we are doing it. Doesn't mean we have to defend it. It's okay to admit that we might be doing some things that doesn't make a lot of sense, but let's just inquire into it. Why are we doing it? Because if we don't inquire into it and if we don't really sort of get at least some feelers on why we are doing it, then we're not in any place to start changing it, yeah? So just sort of, yeah, use statistics, but please also understand the statistics we're using. Uh, <clears throat> so the next question that comes up is, okay, fine, how will work get done? If I don't put people into roles and tell them this is what your role requires, you better shape up, get fit, do what your role uh, requires, my work is not going to done, my company is no, not going to achieve what it set out to achieve. Question again is, Really? <laughs> Are you sure that's the only way? Yeah? So, where did this whole model of work getting done by having roles, and in OB we call it the competency-based framework, which really means you have roles, and then you have competencies within those roles, and then you hire people, you get people, and you try to shape them to, uh, yeah, to, you know, to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To perform in accordance with those competencies, okay? So I think I'll, uh, we'll, I'm just gonna uh, come back, go non-sequentially here <laughs> for a bit. So the competency model actually origin, part of how am I doing with time? I'll take five more minutes, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. five more minutes and then we'll move to the panel. Okay, so the, uh, <laughs> Yeah, this could turn very long otherwise. So the competency model very quickly originated in, so when did management originate? Modern management as we know it and we study it in, yeah, in the industrial age. That's when we started having these large organizations and the whole science and field of management, okay? And think back about to the industrial age, this is the kind of structure you had, no telephones, no computers, communication had to be one way, top down. You had to have very tightly defined roles and competencies. You can't really let people job sculpt and be in a weight and change because it's going to, everything's going to go up and down, okay? And you have one CEO with a paper-based chart in his office. And the only way they could get done in those huge, huge factory settings with, uh, without easy communication that we have and without computers, without the mobile communication without being flexible was to have tightly defined roles. And so you had to like, you had these roles, we are not changing these roles, we'll sort of change or we'll sort of mold the people who can come in, fit in and do our work for us. Unfortunately, that's not so true anymore, okay? That's really not true. Uh, okay, two reasons, wait. Uh, that's not true, so now we don't only have those kinds of organizations. A, we have flatter organizations, and what helps us do that is actually communication, technology, computers. We can have smaller teams, we can be more fluid, so you can actually get work done. In a team of five or six, you can get work done fantastically with, let's say you have a team of five consultants, and this is a very trivial example, but you can uh, extrapolate it. I can have one person who's great at numbers, one who's great at analysis, one who goes and meets the client, one who does the, what else do consultants do? <laughs> Proposals, okay? And they can work together, <coughs> and we can still get work done. Yeah, you can do a little bit of that, you can have basic, yeah, fill in for someone when the other person's not there, but you can actually play to your strengths and still get the same work done without every consultant on the team being that ideal consultant. Do you get that? And that was not possible in the industrial age. That, that is increasingly getting possible now. So, so if you, this is the competency-based model actually where like you had these roles first and then you get people and then you sort of start of like, you know, start uh, fitting them and improving their skills so that they fit into those roles. We can question this, right? So now we can actually start looking at, ah, such, he's such a star, he's so good at numbers, but he's not good with clients and he's not good with presentations, but he's so good at numbers, I'll have him on my team because I can actually afford to have him do the numbers and have other people doing other things. It's not, it's not gonna fit into this, yeah? I'm actually defining a new role for him and indeed that's what's happening. So there, uh, this is, uh, 
Yeah, so, so this is called job sculpting. Yeah, so the HBR article on job sculpting has become very popular, but there's also a ton of underlying research on it. What increasingly people are finding is that if you want to retain stars, retain people who are excellent, it really the way it seems to work better is to allow them to play to their strengths and you sculpt their role or job so that they are actually, they're feeling like the five-year-old you felt like. You're feeling like this is what I want to do. I love doing this. This is great. I love this job because I can do what I'm best at and what I love and I'm doing it very well. Works for the employer, works for the person. So we are moving here. We're not moving here fast enough, I would think. And that's because we are held back by, if it's been going on this way, then let's just continue it. That is just my my assessment of this whole thing, but I'm sure we'll all have our own assessments. And with this, I think this is probably a good uh, place to you know, give all of this to the panel that we have here with a lot more experience. And to you as well, we'll invite questions from you and the people watching on webcast. And let's, yeah, let's dig a little more into this topic because I at least am very interested in <laughs> knowing more about it. Yeah, thank you. So. Yeah, so well, we can, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, Vish, who's going to moderate the panel, and I thought that we could, if there are burning questions now, we can take them, which are more clarificatory about what I said. But if there are questions about the broader topic, we can take them along with the panel. So you don't just have to hear me, but you can hear everyone's views on it. Okay, so Partha, yeah. where if, do we go from here? Those of you who are online, if you want to raise your questions, there's a chat window, you can raise your questions. We will take up these We'll take up these questions during the panel discussion. If someone has a question, you have a question? A quick five minutes and then we'll move on. Yeah, so uh, will you allow me to assume that I've got your question? If I'm not, you can recorrect me. Because I think you have, so I think the way you're looking at it is, you're saying happiness, motivation, and then performance, right? So motivation being the mediator that links happiness to performance, but actually happiness is directly related to performance because when we are happy, we have access to different parts of our brain. So when we're feeling happy, and we can take this offline or I can send you the findings on it. When we are happy, there are actually different parts of our brain which are working. And so, so happiness directly translates into performance, even without going through motivation. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, so we, we'll uh, let the panel also share their views on that. I'm not even going into policy recommendations now. I'm sort of just staying, I'm, I'm really at this end of the spectrum where I'm saying, can we free the space up a little more? Can we free the space up to allow people to work to their strengths? Now, as a manager, you will want to decide to you, for yourself, as when you're creating a policy, there are lots of things you need to look at. For example, if I was a manager, I would not just look at even performance. Like allowing people to play to their strengths would be one of the things, but I would probably bring in a whole lot of other criteria as well, right? So yeah, thanks for raising. We're not looking at the policy yet, but we're looking at the building blocks that will help you create that policy. Is that okay? We're going there? So what okay. We'll do is so, the panel discussion. Ramya is also part of the panel. Yeah, I'll so be there. So I think I just there. I'm feeling I did overshoot my time a little. So I don't want to be the one who keeps you from the rest of the panel. Okay. So I'm on the panel as well, and we'll take your questions. So I, thanks, Ramya. There was a very insightful uh, session. Uh, for me, the takeaway is something that comes to the top of my mind. Uh, as one number one is the idea of excellence. And, and what ideal is a social construct. So anything that is a social construct can be dealt with. 
It's, it's not a part of your neurology, so that is something that you can actually address. Uh, number two is this slide, excellence. So excellence is something to do with behavior, and it's not to do with your identity, right? It's not about being, it's about doing. So, so that is something that comes out to me uh, immediately, yeah. Wonderful session, Ramya. I think I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. A lot of, uh, a lot of nuances, a lot of uh, things that's been popped up during the presentation and hopefully we will address them during the panel discussion. I shall quickly go through the, we have a wonderful, uh, fascinating uh, list of panelists lined up today for you and I'll just run through their profiles and request them to join, them, uh, join us on the stage. The anchor for today's program is Mr. Vishwanath, Vishwanath, Gop, uh, Vishwanath Ji, and uh, he's from the PGP 1984 batch request you to please join us on the stage. Uh, some call him Vish, I call him Vishy. I don't know what he likes to be called. Vish is, I think, fine. So Vish is the founder, director of Organizations and Alternators Consulting Private Limited. He's been on his own for 21 years. And prior to that, for 13 years, he worked in the corporate sector. He enjoys his work as a consultant in OD and an, as a trainer in behavioral sciences. Vish's core purpose at work is to help people realize their true potential. His beliefs are founded on his own personal experience of change as well as on his interactions with thousands of people over his lifetime. His consulting experience has been in the area of IT, manufacturing, pharmaceutical and BPO sectors. During this period, his clientele has included the length and breadth of the country as well as Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and a brief stint in the US. Vish has also been active in the field of nonprofits in India, having done workshops for many international as well as Indian NGOs, including ActionAid, Hab Habitat for Humanity, UNICEF. He's just returned from the Tibetan government in exile in Dharmashala, where he conducted uh, a two-day workshop. For the past six years, he has been a regular faculty at uh, the International Union Against TB and Lung Diseases. In the field of education, Vish has been working with the Montessori movement for over 15 years, working with institutions both in Chennai and Bangalore. He is a professional member of the Indian Society for Applied Behavioral Sciences. He is an MBTI qualified by APT qualifying training program, a life member of the NHRD network. Bangalore and has been on the advisory board of the Center of Montessori Training in Chennai, Tamil Nadu. Welcome, Vishy. Thank you. This is actually a wonderful opportunity for us to actually call back the alums to the institute on some pretext or the other. So Kavita Kapoor is the next one. Kavita Kapoor, please. She belongs to the PGP batch of 1996. Yeah, we can turn this into a sort of a... Yeah. She specialized in finance. She has 20 years of varied experience in finance and planning in IT, telecom, and textile industry. Currently, she's working as a global director for a newly formed 26 billion startup. That's one hell of a startup. Okay, uh, BXC Technology. Prior to this, she worked with IBM for 12 years plus in, in senior positions such as treasurer, CFO, finance controller for global mission, she has experience in mergers and acquisitions for project evaluation and integration of companies. She, appreci she appreciates knowing new cultures and exploring new places. She's an outdoor person who loves nature and wildlife. She's associated with local NGOs that support underprivileged children. Her current passion is in figuring out the effect of meditation and ancient inner technology and performance and efficiency. Soon after this program, she shared with me she's going to the Sadhguru's program. You know, it's in Whitefield? Yeah. yeah, so there you are. The next panelist, Arun Menon, PGP 94. He's my batchmate. Yeah. Uh, Arun Menon is one of the few guys in a batch who actually ventured very early on his own. And he set up a manufacturing unit. You know, most of us, we get into services. He's probably one of those rare breeds who actually got into manufacturing. He has two plants, one running in Mysore and one in Bangalore. And he's into a very specialized area of automation, high-end automation stuff. 
all self-made guys, even Balaji is self-made guy. So founder director of strategy, automation, solutions, private limited. It's a 21-year-old company in the business of manufacturing four and five axis CAD CAM dental milling machines and a factory automation solutions provider. The company has factories in Bangalore and Mysore and has branches in major cities all over India. He is the ex-vice president of the International Society of Automation, Bangalore, and is a life member of, of the Bangalore Management Association. He is also uh, pursuing his FPM in XLRA for quite some time now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Balaji, I'd like to invite you. Balaji belongs to the, please give them a big hand. <laughs> Balaji is another self-made entrepreneur and he belongs to the PGP 93 batch. He's from IIT Madras. He likes to, him. he calls himself uh, creator joy, oh, joy at work. Joy at work. Yeah, that's, the way, that's the way he'd like to call himself. He is the owner of Golden Square Business Center, which provides ready-to-use office facilities which are ideal for new companies. Golden Square Business Center has been, in use, has been used by more than 3,000 companies, and it makes it easy for small teams to have an office. They have six business centers in Bangalore. Balaji is also the executive director of BNI in Bangalore. Many of you would have heard of BNI, have you? Yeah? So he's one of the founding members of BNI in India. He brought BNI to India. And uh, it has more than 45 chapters and more than 1,900 members just in Bangalore? Yeah. Just in Bangalore alone. Balaji is passionate about entrepreneurship. And in his mentoring, he guides entrepreneurs on how to create liberated businesses. He can provide help to people setting up operations in Bangalore with referrals and contacts. He can help companies coming to Bangalore figure out what kind of office infrastructure is best, suit, is best suited to their own needs. Welcome all of you back to campus. Thank you all so much. I now give the floor to Vish. Um, <clears throat> yeah, welcome once again to all of you. Uh, I just have a few opening thoughts and I have the happy job of not having to think very hard, only ask questions. So I've already been warned by Arun not to ask difficult questions. Uh, that too on a live streaming audience and whatnot. Um, just a few thoughts to begin with. Uh, firstly, that I think in um, today's uh, session, the hour or so that we have ahead of us, I hope it's more a you know reflective session, um, something that each one of us is kind of you know wrestling with our own minds while we are here, and uh, hope that we you know some somewhere the penny drops that oh okay maybe this is another way of looking at whatever we are doing. And uh, naturally, then there's no right or wrong, and there's no absolutely perfect answer. Much as uh, management theory or consulting organizations might want us to believe that their mantra is the, you know, is the ultimate thing, and that's what you should follow. Um, so, in a way, what I what I'm hoping that this session will be is really to seed our thinking, really, and not really for us to sort of go away with a with a very specific answer that you know any of the panelists or Ramya or myself have kind of uh, stated um, and that actually therefore the questions are really coming from your own you know from your own inner reflections and not so much you know from the outside in a sense and uh, lastly that I think there are some of us here on the panel I suspect who are already rabid in in relation to the strengths based uh, you know approach so please uh, make sure that you you know tone down our own rabidity so even the start, if you are you know, biased in a particular way, then you know, we may just keep going in that direction. So I think it, it would be very useful for us to also hear some, you know, hear some thinking which is quite contrary to what people are saying. But I think the, the, the fundamental quest of this uh, session really is to look at this whole issue of strengths and weaknesses and how does all of that play out in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, what I would also you know, invite the panelists to do is really to share a lot about their own personal experience because that's really the, you know, the best kind of uh, educator for us, someone else who has gone through something and what, what have they kind of discovered in that, uh, in that process for themselves. Whether it applies to us or not is another story, but at least we know that, okay, so this is what uh, this person has kind of gone through. And that's really, I think, the um, world that I come from, uh, a world where I rather you know i would rather hear someone's experience rather than their conceptualization about it because that's something that all of us i think particularly this crowd is extremely good at conceptualizing and uh, theorizing and thinking and being analytical about anything that's being you know presented so that's a little bit in terms of sort of setting the stage so welcome to the panelists and um, you know i'd really like to 
probably start off by inviting you know any of you who is kind of ready to jump into the conversation to share a little bit about whatever Ramya presented and what has that kind of what has that kind of set you thinking to begin with. Uh, so I really wish that I had done my MBA now rather than 20 years back because uh, uh, starting I, I got into entrepreneurship very quickly because my first experience with uh, a very good job was it wasn't a pleasure to work there and the, my whole concept was that uh, work should be a pleasure it should be joy and uh, so last 20 years has been you know experimenting with organizational models or, or building an organization where people really enjoy working and yet deliver fantastic results uh, so your slides were kind of a fantastic echo in terms of hey you know what yeah i think now if it is bec it's becoming mainstream now these kind of thoughts and that's really really fantastic that was that was my uh, just to give an example uh, we don't have appraisals in our organization uh, we get our team members to set their own salaries themselves we don't have a concept of attendance uh, and we are in a service business, just to give you a flavor. Yeah. Balaji, maybe, um, you know, helpful for us after you've shocked us with all these uh, startling <laughs> facts. Uh, I mean, tell us, tell us a little more, let, tell us a little more in terms of, yeah, I think what, what is important is I think Balaji has already, you know, sort of set us off on that saying that my first job was a pain. And I felt that, you know, work should be pleasure. So what I'd really like to hear from you is, you know, what, what, what were those early days in terms of the shift, in terms of your own thinking? Um, and what helped you to implement it? Because I think in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of thinking, I often find that with a lot of, uh, I mean, since I sort of do a lot of workshops uh, day after day, uh, I find people's thinking is pretty, pretty spot on. And it doesn't matter which sector they are from or at what level they are. But the difficulty is in the implementation, and then there are policies and bell curves and so on and so forth which confront them. So that's really the, I mean, from your own experience, it would be helpful to hear. Okay. Uh, so for me, uh, okay, let's go back a little bit into school plus two and so on, preparing for all the entrance exams and so on. So I think one of my earliest memories during that time was uh, I was studying for my JE exam, and mother, my mother used to come and say, Balaji, you're working too hard. You should go out and play. And in my mind, I used to kind of think, why is she saying this to me? Because I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing. Uh, so uh, when I got into my first job, and it was one of the best uh, companies, it was the Unilever Group, and I'd also got an offer from Tata Administrative Service. So I joined the Unilever Group. And somehow within the first three months, I felt I didn't feel the kind of pleasure I was getting while I was studying. Uh, and uh, essentially kind of noticed that work was being done essentially because of threats and rewards. Uh, either you'd kind of, for example, if somebody says, I want to leave for, you know, attending my friend's wedding or something like that, uh, the manager would typically say, you know what, why don't you meet your, or beat your target for this month, and maybe I'll consider giving you that leave. It's a, you know, if then kind of a thing. If you do this, then you'll get this. And it, and for everything, it was a you know as if it was as if the assumption that people don't like work, and you need to do something, coax them, reward them, punish them, to be able to get some work done. So the fundamental idea of work itself was broken somewhere, and I and if it was this was happening in one of the best organizations in the country, uh, I said I think the business world is broken somewhere, and this is not the world for me. So that was how. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, so it's been an unlearning for me because a lot of things that we learned in IIM uh, <laughs> was not in sync with an approach which kind of said that, uh, you know, people should enjoy work. Uh, so it was kind of, so I used to, in fact, I used to train people how to do appraisals early in my entrepreneurship. Uh, and I soon realized that that's, that was not really productive. It wasn't really giving the results that was really required. I can share later possibly how we do things nowadays and uh, mm -hmm. still kind of survive. Yeah, yeah sure. I was, I was actually also uh, thinking that, yeah, Arun and uh, Kavita, that maybe you want to also share with us some of the early, um, you know, early childhood messages around this. 
um, whether it be at school or at college, you know, what's the kind of messages that we've been getting in, in relation to, you know, strengths and like his mother coming and asking him, asking Balaji, why are you studying so hard? I think I got the exact opposite question. <laughs> exact opposite question saying, look, I mean, you don't seem to have time for this thing called academics. So, and, and, and for me, I think it was, uh, in fact, I would say that um, for me, I think that was exactly the reason for my deep commitment to the kind of work that I do on the, you know, on the, on the business of people's potential and strengths and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just elaborate from uh, what uh, Balaji was saying and uh, yes, Ramya as well. Uh, yes, in the corporates, we have bell curves and do whatever we do, we are just not able to come out of it. To the great extent that last two years, a lot of the IT services companies have come out of the bell curve and you know, we don't any longer give the ratings of one, two, two plus and all. And we've come out with more subjective, you know, how much of innovation you have done, how you have connected with your client, how ma well you've managed your team, and what you have done in terms of some sort of excellence. You define the excellence, out of the box thinking and all. And again, we landed up doing the bell curve. <laughs> Why? Because we have set the parameters, and again, you have exceeded, and you've achieved, and you have underperformed. So somewhere while we have come out of the bell curve, I think we've just gone back uh, to the same thing. But I think I have personally viewed it very differently after two decades of uh, corporate world. Uh, I was like, last six months, I was just thinking, what am I doing? Is it just the office and the work? That That's all was my life. At home, I am getting reviewed of how kids are performing or how happy they are and how much I'm able to play with them. And at corporate life, I'm just the subject to the uh, bell curve. So this is just a diversion to our discussion, but just a thought, just a uh, point I would just like to do is that's where uh, I decided that I need to work upon myself. Something where I would say that what it is in me which I like or which I would uh, want to spend more time on. So I, I know I can't leave my corporate world. That, that's what ignites me or that, that gives me some sense of satisfaction. But there is something more to it inside me, more than that bell curve. And I think once I have assessed that, I have been able to, the bell curve doesn't affect me, and probably I'm able to give that sense to my team as well, and you know, uh, out of that bell curve. But that's, that's more on the bell curve part of it. Uh, one of my experience of my childhood, which I would like to share, uh, was more on, uh, you know, what we define strengths and weaknesses as. Uh, like I remember, uh, uh, right from my childhood, I, I wanted to get into my uh, I am. That, that was a clear uh, uh, aim I wanted to, and that, that has a background because my uh, uh, siblings in the family could not make it so that that became my motivation but I had a big hurdle I uh, second year of my graduation I went to this coaching class and I uh, was sitting in front of him I was like okay for graduation commerce okay and I am you are aiming that I think you should just think about uh, any other university other than I am. I was like, and he was not ready to even admit me. I was like, what is this? I was like, it's so much setback I got. I was like, I'm, I'm preparing for four years, and here you are saying you can't even give me <laughs> coaching. That day when he assessed that I cannot do it, I think it doubled my enthusiasm to work towards it to get it. And that's the year I actually cle cleared. Uh, immediately after graduation, I could clear it. I got a gold medal uh, on uh, graduation also. So I think I thanked him so much that he demotivated me that I could make it. So uh, it, it all depends on how you take your strengths or weaknesses. I'm sure I was not the best uh, student, but then I think he motivated me by demoting me, uh, demotivating me to you just excel on those things. So those are the few points. Yeah, firstly, I want to congratulate Ramya on an excellent presentation. It was so energetic and informative. And there were a lot of thoughts that came to my mind. The, the first thing being, um, you know, when you're talking about teams, it's really ideal if you get a, you know, your constituents of the team who want to do one of each thing. But uh, often it doesn't happen that way. You know, you may want, some people all want to do number crunching. Some guys all want to do BD, some guys all want to do something else. So the ideal situation is if you can have a team where every constituent is good at something and you're getting your work output, uh, which is effective and which is what the organization wants. So sometimes there's this force fitting that, is, that happens. I mean, you, you just can't help it. 
so in my experience, uh, what we have done in our organization, as I have to admit that we are a traditional manufacturing organization, we do have role definitions, we do have the competencies, and we have appraisals. But we have one difference is we don't have everything in black and white. So if we have a good graduate, a real bright spark, who comes in and we see that he's really doing well at work, we don't really have the mandatory six-month probation. We don't have the mandatory after a six-month probation only he gets a raise or anything like that. So if we see that this guy is really excellent at what he's doing, we can take a call, the senior management can take a call and give him a fast track path. And uh, we try and see that we nurture excellence by, my, by having those guys getting a clear message saying that you, we value the work that you're doing and we value your contribution and we are willing to let you have a completely different path than the normal, you know, normal promotion path that's there in the organization. So um, I would also, you, you know, say that the strengths, doing what you love is very, very important, but sometimes there are compromises that need to be made with reference to organizational goals, also sometimes with reference to what the manager needs in his resources so that he can have a high performance team delivering to the customers at all times. We never force employees to take up roles that we define for them. We try to accommodate their interests and, and uh, their preferences also in the roles that we have. And uh, that has helped us in uh, retaining people. That's helped us in having uh, you know, people staying with us for a long period of time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to share with you. Yeah, so Arun, just a follow up uh, question on that. Um, you know, you said that you do kind of try and accommodate people's interests and so on and so forth. So how, what has been your experience in terms of how has that resulted in excellence? Because that's really the kind of connection that we're trying to make here to say that, um, that if, you, if you love what you're doing, then you should be doing an enormous, enormously fabulous, awesome kind of job. So what has been your experience there in terms of has everybody kind of been able to uh, demonstrate that kind of excellence? Or are there some other factors which still seem to prevent them from, you know, kind of getting there? So the instances where we have accommodated people's preferences, we have seen that there has been above average performance, uh, primarily because they appreciate that management is responsive to their needs. We have given them a role that they like, and we see that uh, you know they, they go beyond their normal call of duty and do things in a far, far more superior way than we would have expected them to do. But I think we live in a real world, so it also has to be matched with monetary benefits. I mean, it's not just patting on the back and saying, hey, you're doing a good job. And um, the other thing that I wanted to share with Ramya is, uh, or in our presentation is, happiness is, of course, a state of mind. It's doing what you like to do, but we also have this real thing in the world which is called as money or dollars. And I see a lot of people making compromises there. They like what they're doing in one organization, but they would move to another organization for something more and compromise that and say, look, my family needs it, or my, you know, it's either the parents or the spouse or their own needs, and they compromise in ways. Uh, they would meet you several years down the road and say, look, we like what we were doing with you, but there were needs, there were other needs, and these physical needs overtook my emotional needs or the psychological needs. And that's why I had to move, and that's why I'm you know, in a new organization. To answer your point again, uh, Wish, I think that when we give people roles that they like to do, definitely there is a relationship to performance. Yes, I uh, actually, I, I think this is working. So I, thank you. Actually, I, I wanted, uh, was wondering if we can just dig a little deeper on that. Um, you know, there were two times you used the word real world, real world. And at both those times, the word you used real with money, right? So, and I want, just wanted to hear from the rest of the panel, especially because you allow people to set their own, own salary. Like, like for me, real is happiness. I love money also, I'm happy. Who wants to pay me, pay me, that's great. But for me, money is more illusionary than my feeling because at the end of the day, I can't, I can't do anything. Like I can't cuddle with the money, I can't eat the money, I can't smell the money, and I can't feel good. Like 
Like so, so real for me is feelings and money is more illusionary. And I was sort of like, hmm, he's using real with money. So, and then because you have an yeah. unusual setup, so yeah. maybe what are the others? So I'll take two parts. One is this real thing. So one of the beauties of being an entrepreneur is you can define your own, or you can create your own world uh, based on your own assumptions. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so that's, that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. So for us, uh, if uh, what becomes important, for, at least for me, is that uh, being happy with your work, being liberated, feeling of liberated at your work, and if we can create an organization around that, okay, and money, I mean, see, nowadays, you can get money anywhere. I mean, it's not, I very rarely do, uh, in my team at least, I don't have people uh, who may not be able to get a job somewhere else. They'll, get a, they'll be able to get a job anywhere else. So money is not, is, is a done, done deal, it's over. So now, wow, what next? It's something else, it's about, you know, it's about meaning, it's about some kind of purpose, it's being wanted by your team members, making a difference day to day, being, being engaged in what you're doing. So those are the kind of things which become important. And uh, so, so we don't have a job description in our organization. Uh, how does it help us? It helps us because people are very naturally, they are able to trade work with each other and move on to things that they really enjoy doing. Uh, so we have had people uh, who joined our team, uh, so we run business centers, so who have joined our team uh, and their first roles were possibly serving tea, coffee, kind of a thing. And now they are handling customers, some of them are handling accounts, they are doing tally work, and all kinds of things happen over a period of time. And this is without any formal, uh, what shall I say, appraisal process, or a training program, or you know, next month you do this, or you know, you'll be rewarded with this position. Because some, well, something very fundamental in all of us is the drive for learning, for growth. That's something very, very fundamental. Because if you look at kids, five-year-old kids, or uh, nobody tells them, I mean, you, you'll see kids, they're always active. They're trying to learn something. Uh, a child would be trying to walk, and that's exertion, that is effort. So why is the child putting in that, putting in that effort and trying to learn something and grow? So I believe uh, uh, trying to grow, learn, being excellent is a, a basic human drive. And possibly sometimes because of uh, teachers, bosses, and hierarchy and so on, you, we actually kill that drive. So if you just kind of uh, create an organization where you let people free, uh, you actually uh, you know, create an environment where this drive gets, uh, gets uh, developed. And that's why I like the uh, picture that you showed about the gardener. Uh, so if we look at ourselves as business leaders, our role is to really nurture and just create an environment where things are able to grow naturally. Uh, it happens. It's not too much of an effort, really. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so Ramya, it's really nice that you're talking about the feel and things about like money. Unfortunately, uh, he's lucky that he has that type of a population, and the company he's running, he's able to nurture those, uh, uh, you know, feelings about do what you want and set your salaries. I come from the corporate world. They, they are lucky to be an <laughs> entrepreneur and manage it. I come from the corporate world and uh, they'll be all there someday and we are like organization, a lakh and a half, two lakh uh, people. Uh, it's difficult uh, to get that feeling that money is not the end of it. That's not what li your life is. Uh, the population, uh, average age in the organization would be less than 30. Uh, and they are all fresh from uh, college and to tell them that no money is not you want to look for we still do it it's not that we don't do it we don't tell them to go behind money because there are organizations and mncs we are not the best pay masters but they give good quality work and we are able to retain but that that percentage is very small so the way we do is there there are sessions where we uh, tell them that it's it's the t quality of work you do the type of excellence you achieve what matters and not the money. Money will follow. In corporate world, money will follow. At the end of it, it has to follow. But first, try to do. And th when they are young, that's where, what we want to nurture. 
do what you like, excel, in, and uh, we give opportunity to them to think out of the box. Just just innovate as much as possible. I think more and more of this should come in the corporate world. Then that real world will change probably one yeah, day. No, thank you for sharing that actually. And even as you were sharing this, I realized, uh, you know, so maybe one approach to that is because actually there is, it isn't a trade-off, right? Because happiness, performance, money, there isn't a trade-off because money, like you said, does follow performance. So maybe instead of telling the youngsters or anybody that, hey, don't look at money, go for what you like, you can actually tell them, if you start investing in what you like and what you naturally do, that is actually your path to money also. Maybe not in the short run, but in the longer run as you develop that. And if you trade off that long run path to money into a short run path to money where you stifle yourself into something where you are not being able to give your best because you're not feeling happy, then you're actually also losing that pot of the gold in the long run that could come, no guarantees, but that's just, yeah, just the thoughts that came to my mind. Yeah, so I just have a question for the panelists. Um, what might be the mental models, particularly of uh, this crowd? I mean, I know, uh, I know that, uh, you know, like Ramya reminded us, we were all also one day students. So I'm just wondering, what might be the mental model of students today as they enter the corporate world? And uh, why is it that an organization, I mean, even large organizations, need to kind of tell, you know, tell very bright young people like all of us, of course, uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, worry more about quality of your work and, you know, look at excellence, don't worry at, don't worry about money kind of thing. I mean, what might be some of the mental models we are working with, which is why then we are looking, you know, to quickly quitting and finding another job, which is more lucrative. Okay, let me start on that one. Or where are these messages coming from? I mean, they're coming from somewhere and we are picking it up and imagining that that's what is the right way to, you know, live life. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, the, the student world finally just sees success. They just see people who have been successful. They see all the new startups and the money they have made. Because now the startups in Bangalore, they, are, they all talk about uh, millions of dollars. And that, that's what I think uh, is on the minds of all the students, that how to make big bucks. In the process, it's not that uh, people can't make, and th that population is there. One or two percent of the population will do that because they have great ideas and they'll nurture them and they'll, they'll work on it. So it's not that. But the rest of the population, they have to go through that grind. Nobody has made uh, quick bucks, or, and that's one percent of the population I'm saying. But otherwise, all of us have to go through that grind of, you know, uh, trying to do everything in the organization and go up the chain. What we think as a student is, how do I jump? Just keep jumping. I know if I get every year 30, 40% increment, I'm, I'm at the top. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. Whatever uh, career path you have, you have to dirty your hands. You have to uh, sleeve, uh, put your sleeves up and do that hard work and then go up the chain. And when that money comes, it'll stay for you, with you forever. It's not going to be like you've jump, jumped uh, faster and then uh, you're done with your career. Because then in future, you are not going to get anything to do. So it's, it's just the hard work and how you grow uh, in the corporate world, at least. Um, as far as you are in an entrepreneur world, uh, probably Arun and Balaji will uh, be able to share better. So I'll just uh, share a couple of thoughts that came over here in terms of mental models. I think uh, fundamentally, the, most of us have this mental model that work is something not pleasant. Work is something that uh, you, know, you need to kind of uh, uh, compel yourself to do. So that's a mental model, I think, from school that we are brought up in that fashion. Uh, and somehow we feel that what is drudgery for us is drudgery for everybody else. And what we find, especially if you have a diverse team, is that somebody who doesn't enjoy something, somebody else will actually enjoy it. Uh, I mean, I have got team members who don't mind, uh, you know, spending time just following up on the phone calls. I would say that's drudgery for me, but for them, it's they enjoy doing it. So the idea behind organizing work is to kind of figure out who enjoys doing what, and you know, as a team, can you do it? I'm not saying 100% that uh, uh, you know, work can be a pleasure. There will be some areas that, as a team, you haven't figured out who will enjoy doing that. And somebody has to take up that responsibility and do it. But fund if the fundamental building block is, no, work can be a pleasure. We just need to figure out who can do the unpleasant work instead of doing it yourself. It becomes pleasure and pleasure all, all over. 
Yeah, I was just kind of thinking that why don't we quickly take one or two questions from the audience, even as you're hearing, rather than sort of push it all towards the end. Yeah, we have a ready, ready questioner there. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Ramnik and I am from the corporate world, so my question is to Kavita. So, so Kavita and Arun, I have some tough questions, maybe, from my perspective, I think. So Kavita, uh, you said uh, we didn't want to go into this bell curve business and finally you did some permutations and then you again fell into the trap, right? So how far is it uh, founded on the fact that your wage bill has to be finally fitted in the bell curve and therefore you need to give those budgets to the people you, you know, you finally fit it in the bell curve. So that's the first question. Because I have found from my experience that happened. So Arun, uh, uh, what uh, Ramya recommended to fit uh, your strengths into the, uh, you know, in fact, the fit, uh, you fit the competencies into the strengths of people. Would you take that risk to start it in your company? Okay. Uh, okay. So. Yes, I would like to first answer to your question and then drive you to the correct path. One is uh, corporates have to get their margins done. So no doubt whatever we do on performance appraisals, somewhere it has to get linked to the cost because 70 to 80 percent of our cost is employee cost. So you are right, whatever we do on our bell curve or not bell curve, performance evaluation at the end of the day, it is linked to uh, your increments and bonuses and that has to be tied up because otherwise there's no businessman that way, right? No businessman can work like that, that you know, it's not uh, uh, interlinked. So that, that's one point, so it is li uh, linked. The other point is, why am I going behind the bell car or why am I going behind the performance evaluation? Uh, I remember when, uh, after coming back from maternity, when I, my evaluation was happening, on, and I was doing the evaluation for the uh, for the team, uh, uh, I was I was just wondering. Once I go back, will my three um, three month old baby realize what evaluation I've gone by? Absolutely no. Will I worry about it after three four years? Absolutely no. It is of no relevance. I know. This is the real world I'm talking about, Ramya. But that's what I have gone through. Did that three, uh, that uh, uh, evaluation after maternity matter to me today? Absolutely no. I have grown and I, I don't care about that evaluation or a bell curve. Whatever has to happen, happen. Because happiness doesn't lie there. My happiness is something which, which is inside me. I need to see how it can come out. Believe me, year on year, you get 30% increment, try it out. It's not going to make you happiness and give you happy. And it's a, it's a written rule. It can never make you happy. And you, you can try it out. Jump jobs every three months, you'll get 30% increment. Happiness is not there. As Ramya was saying, go behind your dreams. Go behind your passion. And atomically that happiness will come and then money will surely follow. So that's the second part of the <laughs> response. Yeah, to answer your question regarding strengths, um, I liked Ramya's slide on what she talked about job sculpting. So she, I think the slide said, uh, you know, you, you need to know the strength of your stars better than what the stars themselves know about it. That's a real nice thought, but sometimes there's an incongruence between what you think is a person's strength and what he thinks his strength is. Now, I've often seen it in my organization. I think some guys are great at marketing, but they want to be in design. I, I see some guys who are really good in design, they want to be in manufacturing. I see some guys who are good in manufacturing, they want to be in design. Now, if there's congruence everywhere, it's perfect. Uh, you know, the organization benefits, the individual benefits, and it's a happy story. Sometimes you will have to sit and talk to these guys and say, look, I think this is what your strengths are. Why do you say that you, you are better in, in a particular role or in a particular function? And often dialogue is what brings out some amount of, you know, a, I should say, uh, agreement between the manager and uh, the, the employee that the strengths what he has and the strengths what the manager perceives are the same thing and uh, the organization can benefit. So we've had these kind of experiences in our organization where uh, we request people to move across functions because we see that their strengths lie elsewhere. And uh, it's been a happy story. Sometimes we see 
people from application engineering moving into sales, as a sales guy, you know, getting back into marketing or a design guy going into manufacturing. And in those kind of instances, uh, we have seen that it's had a happy effect. And um, there have, have been instances as well where we have been, you know, telling people what their strengths are because I think many people don't have a process of self-discovery. They really don't know what they're good at and they want to be good at everything, which is the wrong thing to do. You, you have to be trying to specialize. You've got to develop competencies in something so that you can take it to, uh, to a higher level. Uh, so for us, you know, playing the strengths-based uh, approach has paid off. And um, often there's been congruence. In, in, play, in cases where there's not been congruence, we've been able to, you know, come to some kind of an understanding. Sorry, is that a reasonable answer, Navneet? So, uh, I mean, just a comment maybe in terms of how you see it. Yeah, but my answer has still not been given by Arun uh, in the way I wanted it to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Not. So you know what I'm talking. So. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I warned you that. Yes, know, I, I, I could get why you why you asked me next time. In short, in shortage of time, you have you still yeah. asked me to yeah. get into it. So uh, I wanted a direct answer actually. Okay. So how how would he wh what would he uh, do to get this on? He said we can do it, and probably he's doing it in some way. But just to like, we have a competency-based fr framework right now where you have competencies lined up and then you uh, do what you, this bell curve, curve part of it or measure uh, the comp people's behaviors on that. Same thing should happen somewhere in this kind of, uh, you know. Yeah, true. I think, uh, you know, given that, uh, just, just to sort of throw a little bit of light on that, since my own work uh, involves precisely what you're talking about, uh, I think first things first is this belief that I have 17 people and actually all of them can do exactly what they love to do. I think it starts from that belief, which I think most of us don't have. Uh, because, uh, you know, we've all, there's been enough and more messaging that, look, uh, I am likho, theek hai, but agar ABC nahi mila, theek hai, fir bhi tum lelo. So even to begin with, we are being primed up that we may not be the best. And here we have a wonderful example of Kavita saying that that guy didn't even want to admit her into the coaching class. I mean, it's only a coaching class, you know. So, I mean, look at the, look at the levels of, you know, uh, discrimination uh, negatively that's, you know, starting off in our own lives. So I think that's the first part in terms of the belief. The second thing is obviously that you need somebody who is uh, competent, well-versed and who's thinking beyond this current paradigm who's the only person who can actually help you with it in that sense. So I think what happens with organizations is internally when they keep going round and round, they keep going round and round. They don't actually, you know, make that leap of faith to something else. And as uh, some of them were saying, there are organizations which have dumped the bell curve and said that no more bell curve, we'll figure some other ways out. And I think uh, the other part that Balaji made, which I think is very relevant, is that as human beings, we want to learn and grow. We don't want to be stuck in that existing paradigm, which we have already outthought in a sense. So given, a, given the opportunity to create something new, people will. Whether it will be hugely successful or moderately successful, only, you know, sort of time will tell. Yeah, your neighbor wanted to. I just thought taking advantage of nearby <laughs> Mike. <laughs> so, so I'm Bhaskar Sharma. Uh, so I've been working for almost 18 years now. And my question well, goes back to Rame actually. Uh, you gave us this, uh, you know, sort of so-called of a model, we say that strength, performance to happiness. So I was just thinking aloud all this while and when you asked us to close our eyes and we went to this five years, so something obviously very smiling came to, I think, most of us. And then I was reflecting back to my work. So I was just trying to, there were two questions actually. One was, uh, when we get happiness, when we close eyes and go to childhood, then why are we not doing it? What is the fear? What is the negative side of it? I don't know. I don't know if this question is relevant also or not. <laughs> so that was one question coming to my mind. Why are we doing when it is not giving us proportionate happiness? And obviously, that was the first question. Second question came that when we all plunged into work, uh, when I plunged into work, of course there were choices and we uh, opted for choices. And then we finally took one of the choices. And when initially, f uh, initially as of making the career, so we started moving up on that path. So I'm not able to figure out whether, uh, to whatever degree of success I reached it till now, whether I moved in a path of my 
success to happiness or it was a happiness initial started and then moved into my, you know, so because I'm stick to my one path. So, so there's these questions comes to my mind. <laughs> So, so great questions, and they are relevant. And I'll try to do a very short, uh, short response, and we can do a longer response outside also because we could do a very long response on this also. So the first thing, uh, very valid. So when we can just close our eyes and feel happy, thinking about our childhood or think about maybe the trees or anything, why don't we do it more often? Let's just ask ourselves why. It's it's big, and uh, it's really just that. It's just choice, you know, and. Uh, in fact, in psychology, uh, there's a term called synthetic happiness and natural happiness. They're both real happiness, by the way. They're both real. Like synthetic is also real. It's just like man-made. So synthetic, synthetic, synthetic happiness is like what you, you close your eyes and think about your childhood or close your eyes and think about nature or whatever, and it makes you happy. You're, because you're synthesizing it through choice, natural will be, let's say you already have a script in your head that I like chola bhatura, and someone gives you chola bhatura, and you feel happy. Right, so you're not choosing it, but it's becoming, it's coming because of the program in your head. And that's all the difference is it, but the way we actually experience it, physiologically, neurologically, it's the same, happiness is happiness. So, uh, the, the, so, so your answer is really choice, yeah? So if you can choose, you can actually start synthesizing more happiness for yourself and there is nothing wrong or right, like it's just, it's just about getting into the riding seat of your own experiences rather than choosing the default one that circumstances line up for you. That's really it. So I hope that you close your eyes and go back to childhood if it made you so happy more often. And uh, the second thing, uh, the second question you asked, which is uh, about uh, work, right? Success and happiness and happiness and work. So, um, okay, so happiness is the starting point, we can also make it an ending point, right? So we can say, I am happy and therefore I do this, or we can say, I do this and doing this makes me happy. They're both valid paths to happiness, right? And, and, all, and both of them exist in all of us. So um, I don't think you really have to choose too much. So in, in the realm of self-development, and uh, there, you know, you can start getting out of the do, be, do have be programs, like you do this, then you have this, and then you will be happy. Try and break free of that to see if you can become happy up front. So, so that is one way of thinking about the whole thing about success. Do I need to become ha success and then be happy? Again, my short response to that is whatever makes you happy is fine. Right now, if success is making you happy, take the happiness from there also. But do know that it's not the only route. There are other routes available, right? So you can also choose to be happy beforehand and work. And I loved the mental model that he brought up because I think what blocks us, which was sort of implicit in your question from all these routes to happiness, is probably more of that mental model that work and happiness doesn't go together. Happiness is probably we associate more with play or relationships or um, achievement, like, you know, just work, just like I am actually doing maths and I'm feeling so awesome doing maths. We probably, many of us don't have that conditioning, right? So work, and if that conditioning, if we let go of that conditioning or mental model, the word that he used, then these things will naturally fall into place. So short response. Thank so you. That, did that help? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. So me, just mom. one more line to add to. Question here? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's take the next question from, I don't know if there's somebody who's uh, online trying to after mine, please. One small yeah. question. <laughs> Was it standing? So, sure. Hello, ma'am. My question is to Ramya, ma'am. Um, I'm Kaushik, a fresh graduate with less than six months of experience here in IMB as a student intern. So, I wouldn't be asking anything related to work experience as such. The slide, the you spoke about the concept of being an ideal person, excellence, and reaching that. Um, since I'm interested in little of philosophy, what I've read was, uh, I'm going to tell two statements and then I'm going to ask a question. The first statement goes like this, we are always in a continuum where we are in between and there are people better than us and there are people who are uh, not as up to the level of us or we can actually put it in a, put it in a more diplomatic manner. Okay. Then there's also, the second statement goes like this, too much of expectation leads to hmm, disappointment. So my question here is, if I expect a lot from myself, think I want, I, I, I want to go to HBS, I want to become the Prime Minister, 
And that is high expectations, that is unreasonable right now, but you never know, in the journey of my life, I might achieve these aims, what I've set. So how do I deal with setbacks or failures in my path to these? Uh, lots of questions. Again, we'll, we'll try and do justice to them quickly, okay? So the first one, true. So um, in anything, yes, it's a continuum. There'll be people worse than us, better than us. But remember that worse and better is always along, you can only measure it along certain parameters. So if you remember the apple and orange slide, then I said calories or something, right? So once you define those dimensions, you can start measuring and pe putting people on the continuum. But if you're an apple and I'm an orange, in the absence of those dimensions, I can never say, are you better than me or am I better than you? So that was the point, okay? But within dimensions, of course, then you can start measuring and rating. The second thing about uh, expectations, that's, uh, we can do an entire session on that, actually. So this is a very small, uh, my thoughts on it, which is, uh, Expectations by themselves will not disappoint you. This is actually coming from the, <laughs> the very quote in the Gita that inspired me, but it really works for me, right? Unless you insist on achieving that expectations. Like you can have, you say, I want to climb the peak of the mountain, but you can tell yourself, I'm going to be happy during my journey of climbing. I'm not going to say only after I reach that peak, I will be happy. I'm going to be happy while journey, climbing. I'm going to see my friends. I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to have fun. And at the end of it, if I reach the peak, bonus. If I don't reach the peak, I still had fun. I took all these photographs. I learned so much about myself, and I had a good time. And that will actually help you uh, cope with the setback against the fear of failure and not reaching in the setbacks. I uh, hope that helps. It was a yeah, but a short answer. I, yeah. I actually, yeah, I actually have a, a small uh, you know, anecdote to narrate because there was driving back from, uh, you know, driving back somewhere towards home and my daughter was with me. And uh, she had this interesting insight. Um, so she said, you know what, I never give it, all, give it my all. Because if I did, then the damn, you know, evaluation will tell me actually where I stand. <laughs> as long as I don't give it my all, I can always say, if I had tried harder, I would have I think it was either the 10th or the 11th, thereabouts. And I think this is a very fundamental uh, existential challenge for all of us that if I really give it my all, then I might actually fail and then disappointment, all that stuff happens. So I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a point that I think is very, very valuable from the, from the question point of view. And I think that kind of, again, uh, brings us to the point of, you know, when can we really excel? And the only answer to that seems to be when we're using our strengths you know, in a sense, very, very sort of simple correlation. And then the question really is, what are, what are my strengths? And I think I um, liked what Arun said about the fact that people are good at something, but they think they're good at something else, right? So everyone's uh, sort of not very sure where it is. And that's, I think, uh, also uh, an arena that needs dialogue before one can actually arrive at it. And one of my own experiences has been that with most people, we rarely have conversations about our own strengths, even with the people who know us extremely well and with our dearest friends. Our dearest friends are our dearest friends no matter what. But we don't have conversations about what we do and what we are perhaps failing to do because we're actually not utilizing our talents in many, many, many different ways. And uh, sometimes when we, get, when we do get that feedback, we still think that, you know, my, my friend doesn't know me that well. So we sort of move away from it and don't actually pause and say, hey, what are, you, what are you really saying? I mean, are you saying I could be, uh, you know, the CII chairman in three years from now? I mean, come on, are you, are you serious? I mean, so do we really stop to kind of think about it is, I think, a pretty uh, serious question. Yeah. Partha, can we take the ones from the, from yeah, the, yeah. The yeah. The yeah. 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 yeah, let me just read it out. Read it? Yeah. The first one? Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm just reading this out. Uh, this is from... Sima Shastri. Uh, Sima, thanks for your question. I think the job sculpting is an important observation and is here to stay. Is there a model to identify and augment the same vis-a-vis -a, -vis a person in terms of hard and soft skills? Yes, I'll send the link across. <laughs> yes, there's plenty of... Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of work and it is, it is gaining traction, but yeah, this is a asking for resources, which I can send across to the... Uh, Partha, yeah, we have you, that? You'll have we to... We can uh, compile resources yeah, and Sima send it across Shastri, to the whole you can, group. You can uh, drop a yeah. mail to alumni at imb.asnet.in and we shall, you know, 
connect to Ramya on this. Could I, could I just uh, develop on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, we have done some exercises in, so in uh, job sculpt sculpting in uh, Golden Square. Essentially, the exercise is about you know figuring out what your work is, what your strengths are, what your passion is, and trying to create your own designation or uh, job description and so on. Um, so, but one of the things that I've always, so it's a more of an introspection kind of an exercise, and uh, it can happen, and then you share it with your team members and you're able to uh, you know, help each other with that feedback. But one of the things that uh, practices that we, have, uh, we are implementing is how can it happen naturally on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, how can people uh, you know, exchange work or shift work on a regular basis? So we have, uh, uh, so essentially it is, you know, having a team huddle and kind of say, say that, you know, these, these are the things that I need help in and who can help me out in this. So uh, being vulnerable in a way. So can you create a situation where people don't feel threatened uh, asking for help, you know, and uh, creating an environment where there's a free flow of information and the team is able to swap tasks think of tasks which might be uh, you know useful for the organization uh, just because of the way the team uh, huddles are structured so yeah so those are some practices without even you know somebody intervening from above saying a boss has to evaluate you it happens very naturally day to day as a consequence of your of the team dynamics Thank you, Pala. You just made my day. So, you know, uh, I, I was actually, um, so uh, when he said, can we do it on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so here's what I was thinking. I was like, you know, the problem with day-to-day uh, -day basis is, remember in the beginning when Partha started out, he talked about our evolutionary response, which is where, you know, because we, we are evolutionarily wired to actually pay attention to what's wrong or what can be a problem. That's our survival instinct rather than what our strengths are and what is right, okay? So did you get that? In the forest, you're actually better off if you, if you miss out a threat it's, it causes greater damage, it's a greater risk for you. So that's the evolutionary wiring that we have. We have to deal with that. And that can come in the way, right? So that's why when you take time to reflect and do a, okay, now we'll sit, we'll sort of forget about anything that's worrying us and we'll introspect, and that can really help us uncover and touch base with our strengths. But what he's doing, and he said we did it in a day-to-day -day basis. And my first thing was, no, 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 day-to-day -day basis, too much clutter, revolutionary will take over. And then he said, there's no, we create a safe space. So what they're doing by creating that safe space, and he used the word vulnerable, right? Allowing people to get vulnerable, is you're sort of taking fear out of the equation to some extent, right? So you manage to create that with your team where people are actually feeling safe. Because fear is the emotion that's going to come and otherwise disrupt this exercise. And you take fear out of the equation, then your survival brain is no longer holding you captive. And that actually gives you the permission to inquire into your own strengths as well as that of others. So we're going to write a case on this. I'm so happy. I mean, I just know all the theory and you're doing it. So it's like you made my day. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Balaji. Uh, I think um, one of the one of the challenges I think that we also have is the fact that we don't encounter as many uh, situations like what, what Balaji is actually talking about. So Balaji is talking about you know his own organization. Now I'm sure there are some of you in you know right here and now who um, kind of feel similarly in your own teams. You need not be the you need not be the person who's actually leading the team. And I can see some uh, some people nodding to say that yeah, I mean the team that I work in is a pretty safe space. And one of the one of the one of the uh, tragedies is that uh, we don't write about it, we don't talk about it, and if we do, then someone else is there ready to say, "Yeah, but it's a you know it's a jungle out there where I work, right? You may be in some uh, safe place." Uh, I'm just going back to the question on the you know on the screen here. Uh, this is from Rangan. Even if everybody does above average, still some would be doing better than others. So comparison is inevitable, isn't it? Who wants to take that? I've already admitted that we do appraisals in our organization and we do fit them into a bell curve, so this is inevitable. <laughs> this is inevitable. People always say we want to get away from the bell curve, but we don't have a better <laughs> alternative. So um, also, I just wanted to you know, take off from some of the other panelists. I mean, Ramya said you can be happy and then do what you like. I don't know whether it goes from left to right or is it like you do what you like and you be happy 
And I just wanted to ask a question to everybody here in the audience. How many of you are doing things that you like? And are you getting paid enough for it? <laughs> a lot of hands go down, so. <laughs> okay, next question uh, to add to that. How many of you are doing what you like and have you first in your own head given yourself permission to be paid for it? I speak from experience because uh, uh, I write poetry. I've been writing since I was five and I never published it and I thought it was sin to make money out of publishing my poetry. And I attended some workshop, blah, 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 whatever, in this December, like three months ago, that mental model broke for me. That And th th what broke is that it's OK to make money out of something that I like and love, and that is me. And I took all years of poetry, the poems. They were all there, put them into a book, and I published them. And I've not made a lot of money yet, but I have made money. And so, 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 you know, the antidote to that question is not often about are people willing to pay you for it? Are you willing to ask for money for doing something that you like? Because if you think that doing, asking for money for doing something I like is sin or, you know, oh, no, I can't do that, then you won't be making. So just, you know, I was in that trap and some of you might be in that trap. So I thought I'd share that. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you've, got, if you've really re responded to Rangan's question about the business yeah. about comparisons, comparisons being inevitable. Yeah. So this thing about uh, excellence, comparison, performance, and so on, there are two ways to look at a report card. Uh, you either look at it as uh, there's a statement about me and you know and uh, how, I, how I am, and therefore uh, somebody else is telling me that I'm bad. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, hey, this is the opportunity for me to grow in, into that area. So the growth mindset kind of a thing. So. Uh, when uh, so uh, so it's not that we in our organization also we do we have a lot of metrics we have a lot of metrics a lot of numbers and so on and so forth but it is not from a point of view of uh, compensation it is neither a point of you know your numbers will there's no in fact we don't have designation so there's no question of promotion based on your performance and so on so then what then then truly uh, numbers etc become a way for can we do this better? Is it, so it's a learning opportunity rather than a, a reward and punishment opportunity. So, so excellence is really about doing something better for the sake of it alone, not because of something else. So the moment we kind of associate excellence with uh, the joy of doing it, it's, it's like playing a game. I mean, you play cricket, you, yeah, it's like playing a game. You play cricket, you want the scoreboard, and you want to score a lot of runs. And that's the reason why you're playing the game. But the moment you kind of say, for every run you make, you're going to get 100 rupees, suddenly you kill the joy out of it. And that's what happens in organizations. I think we live in a world of comparison. Right from the childhood, uh, we keep see, you know, hearing from parents that, look at him, he is good. Why are you like this? And when you go to school, the comparison starts from the teacher. So I read a uh, line somewhere. It says, success is when you choose to choose yourself. So leaving all the uh, life till we have lead so far, how many of us actually allowing our kids to choose what they want to choose? I, I think this is where the nurturing part starts from uh, parenting, then school, then uh, to the uh, you know, faculty when they go to colleges. I think everywhere this comparison leads, that's what even continuing in the corporate world, leading to either happiness or not being happy with the comparison circle. So how, how this will get addressed, if not this generation to the next generation? Shall I just, so it's just by you know, breaking the paradigm. Uh, so, I mean, everybody in our age, I mean, when we were younger, everybody had to become an engineer, everybody had to become. I mean, today the world has so many opportunities, you can be anything and make a success out of that in whatever your own definition of success or external definition also. So, just, uh, so I heard somewhere, and, and this is fantastic as parents, I remind myself that this is what my role is. I think our role as parents is to just tell our kids, you know, I love you, I'm proud of you. That's it. That's our role, nothing else. Yeah. 
exactly 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 Yeah. So as long as we do, yeah. And like how Ramya ma'am was saying, as long as we don't have a definition of ideal student and so on, and your kid is ideal in his their own self, then that kind of answers the question a lot of times. Partha, how are we doing on time? How? Yeah. Official. Huh? Just a small. Okay. Small okay. <laughs> add-on to that. <laughs> He has officially declared that it is 10 minutes more. Huh? Yeah, okay. Just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. a small add-on to that. Thanks for raising that. And I think increasingly, uh, it's uh, the hope. Uh, we don't have to lose hope for our generation either. Because, uh, you know, our kids, the more we bring them up in the non-comparative framework, they start reflecting it back to us and they help us heal. And I'm really speaking this from experience. Like, you know, I chose to send my son to a Krishnamurti school, and I realized I started reaping the benefits at, at the very ripe age of 40, and I've been through severe comparative uh, frameworks. So I was like someone who derived all my self-esteem from being able to prove to myself, even if no one was giving me an award or trophy, I had to always prove to myself I'm better than this and this and this and this, and then I'll sleep well tonight. So, so somewhat, it was like oxygen for me. From there, I've actually been able to come to a place where I'm like, oh, I'm just good being myself, and I don't have to mentally say I'm better than you and better than you and better than you, and to then start feeling okay about being alive. So that, that healing can occur at any age, and our kids can help us in that journey. The comparison is killing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my take on this is, um, of course, as parents, we should never compare. I agree with you. But as an individual, I think uh, comparisons are inevitable. You have to face it. Whether you're at work, whether you're in school, you're in college, wherever you are, this is inevitable. I mean, uh, 20 years back, we were in this institute and we used to get graded on CGPA. And I, and I came back 20 years later and then we were sitting, I think, in one of the classrooms and we had a session with the prof. And we said, uh, look, the CGPA stuff is not really good. I mean, everybody is just being compared on CGPA, jobs go on CGPA. And uh, you know, you have your name on the board right there. Uh, there's a roll of honor. And the prof said, uh, look, yeah, what you're saying is right, but do you have a better alternative? So I think in IMs, everything, I mean, people come here and from days, day one, they slog their, you know, what off. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, the day zero jobs, the day one jobs are all going to the highest CGPA holders. So comparisons are inevitable. But the point I'm making is as an individual, you have to make your trade-offs. So if you like sports, you like painting, you like music, you will have to spend time with them and your CGPA is going to be compromised. So you have to make those trade-offs. Do you want to be up there? Do you really want to, you know, you don't want to have a life. You just want to get grades. That's about it. And then you have to make those choices. Ron, uh, can I, uh, would you be willing to rephrase? Uh, so I hear you completely, but would you be willing to rephrase the statement that comparisons are inevitable to something like, compa we see comparisons all around us at present, or rather I see comparisons all around me in the people and institutions that I interact with these days, would that be more accurate? Rather than saying it is inevitable, because we don't know, it's not happening there, and right? So even if there's one place it's not happening, we don't want to proclaim it as inevitable, because that stops, yeah. So we see it, yeah, we see it, that's great, we see it, but it doesn't have to be there. <laughs> so uh, maybe Ramya, where he's coming from the fact that it will be there, comparisons will be there, how I am taking to those comparisons will matter. Does it really affect me or I am indifferent to it? Because I know what it is at the end of the day. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question yeah. for Ramya. Uh, hi, I'm a mother of a four-year-old and I'm going back to your slide on uh, blueprint versus molding. 
So um, ultimately, I want my daughter to be happy, right? So um, it, what's my prerogative? Is it, are there blueprints really? Am I supposed to kind of understand her strengths, wherein then I can nurture it and so at least ensure that somewhere the happiness kicks in? Uh, or is it the molding bit? Am I supposed to mold it into a, into a, into something that will make her happy in future? What's my role here? Because now, I, at the age of 34, I feel like, I was just telling my husband, I feel like I want to stand there, be the academician, but it's too late to get in there. Or let's say it's, it's far-fetched. So can I play a role in my daughter's life to understand that blueprint, if there is one? Uh, can I? Um... I don't know. So, and I'm sure you don't want me to tell you. Like, we don't know. So nobody knows. Is there a blueprint? Are we like clay? Are we like seeds? We don't know. But as long as you realize that neither of them is known, proven truth, you realize that you have choice now. So what is your role? Choose your role. And you can choose differently five years down the line. You can choose differently five days down the line. But I just hope you see that you have choice and you don't necessarily have to believe that you have to either mold her or you have to let her be. Just choose. That, just, yeah. to, just to respond, there are two, two thoughts that occur to me. One is from the world of Montessori, which I've been engaged in quite uh, deeply for almost two decades. And uh, one of the simple things that they say is that, you know, when the three-year-old or four-year-old comes running to the parent and says, uh, Daddy or Mommy, you know, see my drawing. Do you like it? Now you, have, now you have to say yes or no, and you don't want to say no to your own child. Uh, so you say, yeah, yeah, it's very nice or whatever, because you think that you want to encourage the child. And the Montessori view is exactly the opposite, which is to flip the question around and ask the child, how did you, how did you feel uh, doing this drawing? Which immediately puts the onus on what the child is feeling on the child rather than an evaluation which the child is expecting you to sort of respond to. And I think we get caught in this business of evaluation. I mean, there is no question about the fact that it is inevitable in schools and colleges. Yeah, just get to you, just one minute. Uh, so I think there is, a, there is a practical way of dealing with these standard, uh, you know, standard kind of scenarios that we may face as parents or as you know, people at, in managerial leadership uh, levels. Um, I think the second part of it is really to examine for oneself. You know, what was my journey about and where did I succeed and where did I fail? And I think that self-examination is very, very critical to the way that we actually, uh, you know, bring our own children up or what kind of a view we have of children. Um, the, the third thing is I think that there are alternative paths. Just because we don't know it, just because we haven't experimented with it, just because we haven't come across it doesn't mean that there isn't an alternative path. So in many ways, I think uh, in, in, in my own uh, Work, for instance, that's the fascinating part that I find that people, there are, you know, in any group of 20 people, there are always two people who are different. And they're in the same job, same set of roles, the same expectations that they will deliver. And there was this guy who used to take two month holiday to Australia and come back and he was working in a software company. Now, which software company gives anybody two months off? But he managed to do it. And I had another friend who was actually from a batchmate of mine from IIM Bangalore, 17 years with Aisha. Every two years, he took two months off to go to visit his family in the US. Every two years one month holiday from each year, accumulated, he would take two months and go off to the US. I mean, how did he manage it in Aishir? I mean, every manager of his was, was upset, saying, how can you be away for such a long time? You're a senior guy, you're getting more and more senior in the system. But he still did it. So I think there are people who defy, you know, the convention and are able to present a good enough case to make that happen. But it's also, I think, because of the fact that they believe that that's the way to live life. And probably if, the, if Aishar had not uh, liked it, they would have said, okay, fine, go and find yourself another job. Maybe he would have. But the fact is that he actually did it for 17 years in Aishar. I'm not talking about, you know, once or twice in his career. So I think there are, there are alternatives which are, you know, out there for us to explore. Yeah, I think that let's take that as the last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And... Uh it's been a great session. Uh, I think uh, a lot of cognitive dissonance in this room is because uh, I think a lot of people tend to think of strengths as something that you can only apply at work or maybe, you know, that's been the association. I think for me, uh, uh, what sort of was a little bit of an epiphany was that, you know, if you think about the strength idea and you say that, look, for a minute, can I put economics aside and not 
say, think about a family setup, right? I mean, it's a family of four. It's very easy to absorb this idea, saying that, you know, it's a family of four, a kid has got a different strength, the father has a different strength. It's very easy to apply it in that situation. Or think of an idea where you're a community, and you know, a community of volunteers, not really, you know, trying to maximize shareholder value, but, you know, trying to achieve, let's say, trying to run an institution like, say, I am Bangalore, you know, I mean, where your goals are not capitalistic in nature, but your goals are sort, sort of other goals, you know, you want to add value to the community. Again, you know, a framework like this is not, I don't think it's likely to see a lot of opposition in a situation like this. I think a lot of cognitive dissonance happens when you're trying to think of allocation of rewards and, you know, people operating in strengths, you know, if outside of that, I think, you know, it, it, it has a lot of value. Obviously, it has a lot of value in the capitalistic system as well. But I'm just saying it's less a cognitive dissonance if you dissociate the rewards and distribution of rewards with strengths. Yeah, thanks. I think that was a great way of looking at, uh, looking at that whole, uh, you know, the whole domain. Yeah, bye. I think the idea is to learn from the voluntary kind of work. I mean, you have phenomenal successes happening because people are volunteering their time and creating something beautiful. I mean, a good, great example is Linux or Wikipedia and Wikipedia, so on. Wikipedia, yeah, I was right? about to say that. Yeah, and the point is, why can't we do the same if that is such a successful model? Why can't we bring it into a business world and make it work there? And I think there, uh, there are examples out there which kind of say that it is possible. Yeah, I just had a suggestion, Professor Ramya, and that is the, we were talking about um, the mental model and what kind of feedback we would like to give to the people who are, you know, going and entering the corporate world. So I've been in this area, or rather in the corporate world, many areas in the IT sector for two and a half uh, kind of decades. I think the one uh, big thing which always uh, happens when people come from very uh, cream, you know, cream to la cream layers, is it's all about me. So we tell them, hey, it was all about you, but then when you come in, it's all about how you can contribute to what's happening here. Did you contribute to the team? Did you contribute to the company? Because it's not necessary to be at a corporate level to contribute. Now you can, everybody can give suggestions to improve so many things. They are very, very open in the IT sector and all. So suddenly they say, hey, this is not about me anymore. You are putting me with all the rest of the people. So that is the big mental model. So we say, welcome to the corporate world. You got to prove yourself, okay? About how you can contribute to the customer outcome. So you might be good at everything that you did here and the best in the country, but in that customer outcome, maybe somebody who came from a tier two city was able to manage the customer and deliver the outcome, which you couldn't. And you have to have the humility to accept that and work within the team to see how can we turn this around. So it is not about you and sculpting a job for you and with your degree and whether you came from IIT or I am. It's about what was needed and you're on your own, you know. Usually teams are on their own. You might be different cultures, different languages, different technologies, so many complex organizational problems. They have to deal with it amongst themselves and figure out what to do. You don't have people supervising and saying, okay, today you do this tomorrow. So the humility to fit in, if you are able to contribute that to resolving that problem on day one, hats off. Then the team themselves will give the feedback that this guy you know, needs to be rewarded. So I think that mental model about contributorship rather than just individual excellence is one thing which is uh, we keep dinning that in when they enter, and it would do well if we can give that right at the time of the, you know, educating people themselves. It's, I think it's nothing, people who come from a background of sports and all that, I always look for such people. I always tell them what kind of team activities have you done. You see, once you're in a team, you can't say I'll keep bowling, or I will keep do it standing at the net. I have a weak guy, I have a strong guy, one guy is good at this, the teams keep changing, opposition keeps changing. You have to manage, right? You can't say I'll kick this guy out for this uh, engagement, you cannot. So you have to pull up 
the other guys and other guys are pulling you up in areas which you do not uh, you're not shining right you might be a wizard so thank you i think yeah i yeah. think we we, we yeah, get your point think, uh, so i just sort of uh, maybe wrap it up in one sentence keeping sure. time sure. also in mind which is uh, your point totally accepted in fact when uh, you were talking about uh, when he was giving the example right about how they allow people within the organization to you know do if i do you want to serve tea or do you want to make calls and they are choosing their own things I, I I didn't ask, but I assume that they do have an organizational vision, right? Then they, they have a goal for the organization, and then within that, people choose to do what brings them alive, what they like doing, but definitely keeping in mind that they want to contribute to the ultimate goal. So that is never taken off. It's not that I will do this because I like doing it, and it has nothing to do with the goal of my organization. So we're not talking about that. So I totally get your point that we want to sensitize people to keeping them all in parallel, right? At the same time, you don't want to only keep that organizational vision in head and forget that if you are not happy, you're not able to contribute also. Your team won't benefit because you you'll be a half dead person then you have become a liability for your family for your team for anything so to sort of maintain both of these and hold them together would be where i would see this going yeah i think we'll uh, kind of bring this to a close and i'm not going to do the summarization so uh, i believe you know each one of us takes away what he or she wants to but i think just one thought just struck me just now which i think is at very much at an individual level which is that I think each one of us is responsible for the strengths and talents and gifts that we have. I don't think we can outsource that responsibility to anyone else. And so if we are unhappy, then I think we have to take responsibility for it. Uh, and if we believe that we have strengths which can contribute significantly in another part of the organization or in a different organization or whatever, I think we only have uh, to kind of look inwards and to kind of ask ourselves why are we not you know, moving in that, in that direction. Um, and to me, I think um, uh, for for you know for for uh, any number of people who have actually done it, who are who are extremely happy in their jobs, I think that's basically what they've done. They've said, "This is what I'm good at, and uh, this is what I enjoy doing." Incidentally, the two are necessary. Um, uh, one without the other doesn't really help. And that I think responsibility is what we've got to kind of ask ourselves every morning as to whether we are we've taken that responsibility or not, because the external circumstances are what they are. I mean, I think we have we have little or virtually no control over over those. But I think we can we can, and uh, you know, I think we we should take uh, take stock of that. Um, not easy, <clears throat> not easy. Definitely difficult in an environment which doesn't believe what you believe. But I think uh, we have to kind of work at it little by little. You know, gathering our allies and creating that uh, you know that that environment or ecosystem which we wish somebody else would create for us, you know, some top leader and so on and so forth. So a lot of expectations are there, you know, pointing upwards for people, you know, either at the, at the early stages or at their mid stages. But frankly, I mean, that I don't think uh, is, is really, I don't think it's worth waiting till, you know, leadership kind of decides to change its mind around this. I think it's better for us to start creating that uh, change. And uh, yeah, so I think, um, thanks a lot for being here. And uh, for all your uh, questions, which I think um, hopefully, you know, took our discussion to a uh, brighter and a more meaningful level. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Bhatta. Absolutely, absolutely. Please give them a big hand. Thank you so much. And please give them a big hand. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so, uh, Rishi clearly stated he's not going to summarize, but let me summarize my thoughts on this. Okay. Some of the takeaways, the panel discussion was very interesting. You know, the, the, the first session was really interesting. Ramya threw up a lot of questions that made us reflect on, on what's happening out here. And, and uh, a lot of the questions were thrown up by the audience too. Very interesting questions. So uh, one of the first things, uh, I just made a quick note of some of the few points. I thought I'll share my own personal takeaways that would make me reflect. One of the first things that came out was what uh, Ramya, I think, was mentioning about the real world and, and the role of real world and money and stuff like that. So, and, and how money is a mental construct that we have, which basically enables us to navigate the world. You know, it's, it's, it's a construct that we have set up for our own selves, for our own convenience. The number system is another one. The numbers are a system that's, that's now totally ingrained into us. We, we have internalized the number system. So if aliens were to come, probably the decimal number system is not the default number system for them. Okay, the number system, the role of money, 
uh, gravity, electrons, the Bohr's model, all of them are mental constructs that, we, that help us navigate the world. We just have to remember that. Money is one of them too. Uh, so what, what's important, another thing that just I made a note of is uh, the, the relationship between money, success, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a belief system. I think this is what uh, uh, Vish had actually mentioned. Where, where, where are these things coming from? Are, are, are uh, thoughts about money, success, performance, etc. Where are these beliefs coming from? Uh, from the outside world, from the immediate experiences, vicarious and otherwise, or direct experiences, right? So, so there are a belief system. So if you want to uh, unshackle the way you're thinking, like Ramya says, you need to go back to what needs of yours are being met and open up the choices available in front of you. And, and uh, that would mean a bit of self-awareness in terms of uh, reflection, checking out what, what are the kind of beliefs that limit your growth. Right, so that, that is another interesting uh, point. Another in interesting point was about the bell curve, about the role of aggregation. And what someone else said was, how do you chunk down aggregation? In a large organization, the certain things might not really work. The statistics that you have is at the aggregate level. Uh, the, uh, the numbers don't capture human emotions. Right, so at the end of the day, you need to chunk it down to team level and see what is it that's going to work at the team level or at the individual level. Another interesting idea, which I think Harun mentioned, uh, is, uh, is about uh, what the team manager might think is the strength of the employee and what the employee thinks his, are his strengths. But the process of how do you discover these strengths, is there a process behind it? I'm sure for shortage of time, we haven't gotten, gone into it. And, uh, there, there's a process in terms of how you can discover your strengths and how you can chunk it down. And uh, there is another, I think there is quite some discussion about the role of comparison. I think comparison, uh, personally, when I look at comparison, it's not the comparison as such which is an issue. It is the how do you compare? You know, how do you compare? Do you compare people? Do you say do you want to become like Sachin Tendulkar? Or are you, going to, are you going to talk about the skills and the behavior that Sachin Tendulkar displays that you wish to emulate? Right, so where, where do you compare? Do you compare people at the identity level are you comparing skills, behavior, or the thought processes that they exhibit, which you can probably learn from? So these are some of the high-level thoughts. One more, one last thought, okay, is, is about the role of language. When you compare, what is the role of language? Language, once again, we have developed ourselves, and that's one of the way we actually experience the world. We call it a secondary representational system of, of trying to experience the world, the primary re representational system being the the sensory experiences that we have. So what is the role of language in, in comparison? So that's something we need to reflect back and see how do you compare. So these few final thoughts, I'd like to you know, uh, thank all the panelists, Vish, Kavita, Balaji, Arun, and Ramya for, for being here, for, uh, and to all of you too for having taken time off on, uh, for today. We have a